Hey folks, and welcome to the Petra Pan Apparel YouTube channel, a place where we celebrate women through learning about fashion history. Speaking of fashion history, I'm here for you today in my uh, little beach pajama inspired outfit. Sitting on the floor. And I'm wearing this outfit today because the topic we're going to cover is largely set in the 1920s and 30s when beach pajamas were a huge deal. So this is the first installment in our designer profiles series and today we're going to be covering the incredible story of Elsa Schiaparelli. Now we're only going to be covering the first part of her life up until World War II because her life is just so fascinating. Uh, it needs to be broken down into more than one video. So most of my information is coming from her autobiography, Chalking Life. And so of course this is her writing about herself. And this is a fascinating book because it I think it has been translated into English from Italian or French. And she part of the time speaks about herself in the third person and part of the time in first person. So very interesting read this one. So a few disclaimers up front, I am by no means an expert on Elsa Scaparelli, her designs, her fashion, her legacy, her life, but I am surely an enthusiast and I adore her work. I adore her as a human being and I have read a lot about her and I just want to share my passion for her with you. Another disclaimer is in the book, Elsa Schiaparelli was a woman of many friends. Now, she doesn't really describe herself as an extrovert, but she had many, many friends in many, many different circles. It's very easy to lose track when reading her autobiography because she's just mentioning people right and left, so I won't be including too many names of her friends. If you're interested in, you know, learning more about exactly who she was connected with, you can pick up a copy of her autobiography, Shocking Life. You can find it pretty much at any bookstore, as far as I know. So, to give you a bit of context for Elsa Schiaparelli, she was born in 1890, and there was some debate about the year she was born, so there were sources that said she was born in 1890, 1895, 1896, but according to her birth certificate, she was born in 1890, and she was born into an incredibly intelligent and academic family. Her father was an expert in Middle Eastern studies, he was an expert in Islamic studies, in Arabic, in Sanskrit, in medieval manuscripts. He was a highly respected academic. Also, her uncle Giovanni Schiaparelli discovered, as she says in her book, canals on Mars, um, and he's still a well-known figure today, and she tells a story about how kind of a recluse he was. He was incredibly intelligent, but uh, did not socialize well, and there were people in his community who really wanted him to pursue politics because they respected him as a person. One day, some influential gentlemen called on him because they wanted to try to persuade him to become a senator, and it was a hot afternoon in the summer, and these very well-to-do gentlemen come up to the door, knock on the door, and Giovanni Scaparelli, her uncle, answers the door completely naked. He had been absent-mindedly studying, researching, not a stitch of clothing on him, and just answered the door. Of course, in the end, he was made a senator. Elsa Scaparelli had a cousin who was a prominent Egyptologist, and she says that museums were filled with his discoveries, but she describes him as the ugliest man she had ever seen in her life, who was clutching onto the last hairs on his bald head, would often glue them down, but she respected him greatly. Now, Elsa Schiaparelli's strongest connections were definitely with her father, and she had a very tumultuous relationship with her mother. Her mother very openly favored her sister, and would often talk about how beautiful Elsa's sister was, and how ugly Elsa was. And of course, this damaged Elsa deeply, she often dreamt of how she could force herself to be more beautiful, and she imagined, a bit of foreshadowing here, imagined a woman with flowers growing out of her face and how that could make someone be incredibly beautiful and she could be the only woman in the world like her. So as a child, she acquired seeds from the gardener and planted them in her mouth, in her ears, in her nose to try to grow them into flowers on her face to become more beautiful, and of course, her plan was discovered and she had to be taken to the doctor to have them removed. This just goes to show the kind of obvious connection that Elsa Schiaparelli would have to the surrealist artist 
before surrealism even really existed. She also admits that she was a very difficult child, and in her book she said, nothing has really changed. She is still difficult. A few stories from her childhood, she convinced the cook in their house that she, in fact, was not the birth child of her parents, but she had been rescued and adopted by her parents off the streets, which moved the cook to tears, and for days the cook had these waves of emotion and finally confronted Elsa's parents about it and discovered that it was a complete bald-faced lie. And Elsa Scaparelli, since she was very young, went by the nickname Scap. Jukey! Juke! 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 Hey! Leave it! Come here, sweetie! Whew! Gonna need this. Okay. So, when Elsa Scaparelli was six years old, she attended and participated in a little patriotic parade, and at the time, there was a lot of unrest in Italy. Um, this would be approaching the 1900s. The parade goers were met by a communist group, and very quickly the demonstration turned violent, and riots started breaking out. It was a bloody clash between groups, but Scaparelli says that she had a wonderful time. At six years old, it was the first time that Scaparelli says she had felt truly free, and at six years old was in full knowledge of her ego. She followed the riot on... <coughs> Duke. Duke will be joining us for the remainder of story time because there is too much going on outside. And he's talking about it and he just keeps woofing. So Elsa Scaparelli uh, was following this riot uh, for several hours and it was a violent clash and a lot of people died in this but Elsa Scaparelli was just fascinated by the noise and the chaos of it all. So at the end of the day it got late into the small hours of the morning and Elsa's decided she was tired and she was hungry so she hailed a cab which was a horse-drawn carriage at the time hailed a cab and asked him to take her back home when she arrived back home to her family who had been worried sick about their daughter who had been missing for the entire riot and assumed she was dead. A lot of children were actually killed in the riots, had been trampled. Uh, she turned up at home, got out of the cab, and said, Daddy, please, will you pay the cab? Elsa was a very strong-willed child and did not do well in school, though she was very intelligent. She did not align herself with religion, but she attended religious schools and was very much inclined to mysticism. How did she describe it? Scap describes a story where she had an innocent little flirtation with a boy a little older than herself, uh, which ended one day with a kiss, and she was so excited by the romance, but at the same time guilt-stricken because of the strict and rigid rules she had grown up with, so she went to a confessional and unfortunately met with a rather tactless priest who asked her questions leading to things that she had didn't know anything about because obviously sex and bodies were something not really spoken about to young girls at the time. So she was hurt by the revelations and the questions in such a deep and personal way. She never, she left the confessional and never went to confession again, which to the time of writing this book, she regrets. She believed that confession was a wise and really noble and healthy practice of the Catholic Church. Scaparelli was sent to yet another school, and at this school she began making her own clothing, and she also began to experiment with writing romantic and kind of erotic poetry, which she kept secret and nobody really knew about for a long time except for her cousin, who was a little more of a progressive member of her family, and she showed the poetry to him, and he thought it was really, really remarkable, so he passed it on to a publisher. The poetry was published and was really, really well received and really successful, but her family was horrified and she was disgraced from the family. From that point on, things were never really the same between Scaparelli and her family. As a result, she was sent to another convent in Switzerland, and this one was known for being incredibly, incredibly strict. Scaparelli was really determined not to be broken by her treatment at this convent, and she told the nuns exactly what she thought of them, and as a result, she was sent to bed for days. And in a panic, she decides she's going to go on a hunger strike. So she's still forced to do all of the same chores, all of the same things, 
While on this hunger strike, she was fainting all the time, so she smuggled a message through the daughter of a prime minister who was leaving the convent to go visit her family. And as soon as her family received the message, came to the convent very disapprovingly to rescue her. Shortly after, she was offered a job as a nanny for a friend of the family who lived in London. And on her way to London, they stopped in Paris. And as soon as she arrived in Paris, she said, this is the place where I'm going to live. She knew exactly that she was going to end up in Paris. She was invited to a ball, but she didn't have anything to wear, so she went out and bought this really expensive fabric. She brought two yards of this fabric and wrapped it around herself and fashioned out this gown without any sewing and describes how she nearly danced the dress off of herself at this ball, but she had the greatest time and fell so, so in love with Paris. Off she goes to London and there she attends a lecture on theosophy, which is a really popular field of study at the time, very trendy, a lot of artists involved. She describes herself as being completely spellbound by this lecture, approached the lecturer to speak to him afterwards, and in less than 24 hours they were engaged and then married, much to the dismay of her family. She and her husband moved around, never really quite able to settle into life together, so her husband decided he wanted to go off to New York City, so off they went. When they arrived, they had a lot of trouble settling in, and the marriage was not going well. They began running out of money as they were living off of Scap's dowry. Her husband often began disappearing, surrounded by moonstruck women, as she describes them, and famous dancer Isadora Duncan marked her husband as someone to be conquered, and at an event with Scaparelli, there beside him took all of her clothes off and danced in front of him. And at this time, Scaparelli became pregnant, and during this affair with Isadora Duncan, she gave birth to their daughter, Go -Go. One night, Scaparelli's father came to her in a dream, looking very pale and sickly, and as soon as she woke up, she knew that he had died. A cable came a few hours later, and it was true. Uh, Scaparelli says she felt at that moment that she had lost her deepest connection and at the time was preparing for her daughter to be born. Her daughter was nicknamed Gogo -Go for her continual gurgling noises, and at the time of her birth, Scaparelli's husband was nowhere to be found, uh, so she had to actually find a place to stay as soon as the baby was born. And because she was a single mother with a baby, she would not be able to find any lodging at a hotel or apartments, so she actually had to leave the baby in the taxi to go and book herself a room at a hotel. As Go Go's, uh, let's see. Because she was now a single parent having to support herself and her child, Scaparelli was desperately looking for work. She tried many different jobs, many of them she says she was absolutely no good at, and so she had to make the really difficult decision to send her daughter off to live with a nurse so that she could earn money to support them. Scaparelli was often on the brink of going hungry because all of the money that she earned that did not go to her rent went to the nurse to pay for Gogo's care. Because of her husband's connections, uh, Scaparelli had a lot of relationships with different surrealist Dada artists. Just as an example of one of these situations that Scaparelli continually gets herself into, she accompanied a friend to Cuba who had a role, a starring role in an opera. Going in and meeting the people of Cuba and looking at their entertainment, Scaparelli knew that this opera was not going to do well and her friend was not going to be well received. To no one's surprise, the opera was a spectacular failure and Scaparelli and her friend had to flee the country in order to escape being liable for the losses of the theater. After returning to New York, Scaparelli was given a little cottage to live in and she was able to live for a short time in this peaceful little location, but soon after things went from bad to worse and Scaparelli learned that Gogo -Go had been diagnosed with polio. And at the time, treatment was hard to find, it was really expensive, so another friend offered to take Scap and Gogo -Go back to France with her as a guest so that Gogo -Go could receive treatment in Paris. Before they departed, Scaparelli legally changed Gogo's -Go's last name to her own maiden name, and shortly after they arrived back in Paris, Scaparelli's divorce was finalized. She was able to find some work when she got back to Paris working with an antique dealer. Because of her connections in New York City, she fell into some very similar relationships in Paris with Surrealist and Dada artists. There she was discovered by Paul Poiret, who was an incredibly famous designer at the time, and he began clothing her for free and encouraging her to pursue becoming a designer. 
but this was still something that Schiaparelli was not ready to commit to. So by now, Gogo was still in treatment for her polio. Uh, at age six, it was time for her to choose a nationality, and she was able to choose between American, French, Italian, even Polish, because her husband had had a Polish passport. So little Gogo at age six decided she wanted to be an American citizen, so she goes to a citizenship ceremony at the consulate, and Scaparelli says, at age six, raising a very pudgy hand, she swore loyalty to the country that was henceforth, that was henceforth to be hers. And after the ceremony that night, Scaparelli describes a conversation that I think is really indicative of the relationship between Scap and Gogo. After the ceremony, Gogo asked, Mommy, where is my father? He was then dead, so I tried to explain to her what death meant. There was a long silence, and while I was pondering what the next question would be, the small voice pronounced, Well, after all, you are my father and my mother. So, deciding what to do with her life, Scabrelli writes about wishing to be a man so that she could have the freedom to go anywhere and do anything without any... without anyone accompanying her, to have the freedom of men at this time, because she knew that she was never going to marry again. She entertained the idea of designing clothes, but, quote, I was told by a charming gentleman who was very polite that I would do better to plant potatoes than to make dresses. Around about that time, she ran into an American friend who was wearing a really interesting sweater. She asked this friend where she had got the sweater from, and the friend directed her to an Armenian couple with a knitting factory. Scaparelli had an idea to produce a sweater, very much like something you would see today, a sweater with a, a pattern knitted in to make it look like a bow. So she approached these knitters and they figured out exactly how they would get this crazy design that had never been made before into reality. And the sweaters took off internationally. Women of every country were wearing these sweaters with the little illusion bows. The sweaters were being copied right and left, they were being licensed, and Scaparelli's name just exploded. She expanded the range to include sweaters that had little illusion scarves, little scarves around the waist, and even a line of skirts. Her success was such that she was able to open her own workspace. She moved into number four, Rue de, Rue, Rue de la Paix. I'm sorry for the pronunciation. She chose to use her own name for the design house, even though people questioned her saying, no one is going to be able to pronounce it. And she says that is actually true. No one was able to pronounce it, but she wanted to use her own name. Her design house became known for these daring designs of padding out the shoulders, raising the waist, and keep in mind this was the 1920s when we were compressing the bust. The silhouette was a straight boyish silhouette, no emphasis at the waist. The waistline was kind of dropped to the hips, so this was really wild and crazy and out there. At the time, she was even dressing the likes of Amelia Earhart. Her apartment above this workhouse was rat infested and she even got herself a little dog who was equally afraid of the rats and was not able to help her out with her problem at all, which was not her intention. So she and a friend moved into another apartment. This apartment was furnished with incredibly modernist furniture and she held a dinner party in which it said that uh, Coco Chanel, that Chanel attended and absolutely hated her furniture. But it was no secret that Chanel and Scaparelli did not exactly get along. Chanel is quoted calling her the Italian artist that makes clothes. They were frenemies at best. Interestingly, with her wild and out there designs, a lot of her clients were really smart and conservative wives of bankers and diplomats and people like that. A lot of women who liked severe suits and black dresses. Now, one of my favorite garments of the 1930s, which is the decade that we're moving into now, is called the Mad Cap. It's called the Mad Cap, and it is a little knitted kind of peaked cap. It's got a little point at the top, almost like a Peter Pan hat. And Elsa Schiaparelli uh, came up with a design for one of these peaked hats, and it quickly took off. Manufacturers were licensing it and copying it. Manufacturers in America started calling it the Mad Cap. And even though she had designed it, she 
started seeing it copied everywhere, and Elsa Scaparelli never minded copies. She says in her book that, quote, the moment that people stop copying you, it means you are no longer any good, and that you have ceased to be news. So she never minded the copying, but she got so sick of seeing the madcap everywhere that one day she actually saw the cap on an infant in a little stroller, and she said to her assistant, right, get rid of it, and had all of their remaining stock destroyed. Elsa Scaparelli also had an eye for interesting women and helping women to really discover their styles. She tells a story about a thin girl who seemed ugly and dowdy sitting in the corner of her salon. Scaparelli took an interest in her and in this sharp husky voice the woman allowed Scaparelli to just dress her in any way that she wanted. The young woman's style was completely transformed. Who was this woman you might ask? None other than Katherine Hepburn. Funnily enough, Scaparelli caused an uproar traveling to London once when she wore one of her divided skirts, which is now what we call like culotte. She caused this uproar, of course, because we had women dressing like men and it was such an issue. But interestingly, Scaparelli did later say that she did not believe that women should wear trousers. But divided skirts were okay. And Katherine Hepburn also famously wore trousers interesting connections there. So with her newfound fame, she returned to America in a very different situation than she had arrived before. She was greeted and celebrated by the press. She traveled to Hollywood and there she credits herself with the introduction or reintroduction of shoulder pads in fashion and Joan Crawford incorporating her shoulder pads into her silhouette. Her business continued to grow and grow and grow and when she moved back to Paris, finally they had outgrown the salon and workspace that they were currently in and had to move to a larger location. At this new location, Scaparelli began the Scap Boutique, where you could buy things like scarves and blouses and things off the rack and ready to wear. So she credits herself, even though we know this had been either done or was being done around the same time with the first idea of the boutique. And in this boutique, we are introduced to a very important character, a tall, blonde, who was not opposed to wearing any amount of ridiculous designs that Scaparelli could come up with, and this person was called Pascal. And Pascal was made of wood and was Scaparelli's treasured mannequin, who sat in the window and would, without argument, wear anything that she prepared. The boutique and Pascal became famous and kind of a tourist destination for people visiting Paris. And Scaparelli continued to experiment with daring designs and she was often known for very unusual buttons. And with the tensions of World War II starting in the mid to late 30s, Scaparelli recognized that there was going to be a need for more kind of utilitarian clothing, so she released a collection that shocked buyers, and rather than her unusual statement buttons, had zips all throughout the collection, on evening wear, on her day dresses, in really unusual and prominent places. And people were shocked, but the American buyers in particular were just buying up her designs to take back, to have manufactured. The buyers just kept buying these designs, and when it was finally time to ship the dresses off to America, there was a problem with importing the zippers into the United States, which rose to this massive political issue, finally the dresses were able to be delivered. Scaparelli has some really beautiful quotes on the intimate nature of dressing women and again compares the dressing room and the fitting room of her salon with the confessional. As in a confessional, the screens hold their secrets, she says. Many unknown things, subterfuges, deceits, were revealed in their sanctuary. But these revelations never went beyond them. They alone heard the stories of wives and mistresses, saw the maimed bodies of women thought to be beautiful, or the secret loveliness of women considered plain. And if Scap looks and listens with pity and sympathy, she forgets everything at six o'clock when she leaves the office so all is safe. She then releases a collection to kind of celebrate the progress and prominence of her design house by having a fabric designed and printed with newspaper clippings all about her in all different languages. She had it printed on cotton and silk and designed blouses, men's pajamas, scarves in this newsprinted fabric. Nobody thought this would sell, but it went like crazy, and you can even see designs like this still popular today. Scaparelli was then invited to present 
at the Paris exhibition in 1937 in the kind of courtyard of couture. Scaparelli, being who she is, insisted on having Pascal, her most beloved mannequin, to show off her designs. And because Pascal was old and wooden and did not match the other mannequins in the courtyard, she had to fight, but of course, in her nature, she fought and won, and Pascal displayed her designs at the exhibition. After the exhibition, Scaparelli decided to take Gogo on a trip to Rome because she had not been back to Italy to see her family in a very long time. But of course, into the late 30s, we have these rising tensions with Mussolini, and though Scaparelli was not a political person and never outright stated her political opinions, this problem followed Scaparelli for a large part of her life because of her Italian heritage. After her trip to Italy, she was then invited, of all places, to attend a textile exhibition in Russia, a, a highly unlikely place to be asked to travel at this time. She accepted and traveled to Russia. To everyone's surprise, was asked to design a costume for the average Soviet woman. And because of her persuasive nature, she was also allowed to enter and access the Kremlin, which had been off limits to pretty much everyone, including diplomats living in Russia. As a result of this trip, there's a pretty hilarious comic of Scaparelli uh, depicted having a conversation with Stalin about the influence of Western fashion on Soviet women. After her return home, Scaparelli decided that she would expand the business into perfumes. She released her perfume, Shocking, which, again, against the advice of many, many people, was a complete success. At this time, she also began collaborating with surrealist artist Salvador Dali, and some of her famous famous items that she is most well known for came about through this collaboration. Things like the shoe hat, the tear dress, the lobster dress, and the chest of drawers dress. And with her business growing and growing, she released three very famous, very prominent collections at this time. She released the Pagan Collection, the Astrological Collection, and the Circus Collection. Scaparelli is living in Paris, so tensions are just building and building and building in the lead up to World War II. This is where we will stop this video, and I will include more information about these three prominent collections in my next video, which will detail Scaparelli's life and work from World War II on. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I know there's so much information, and it's really difficult to distill and determine exactly what stories to tell about Elsa Scaparelli's life into this one video. Um, I've spent a lot of time going through trying to decide what, which stories um, to include and I've chosen all the ones that I, I feel like have related to her work, to her legacy. So I absolutely adore Elsa Scaparelli as a person and I hope you've learned a little bit more about her and I hope you will join us in the next installment of Elsa Scaparelli's life. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, please subscribe, like this video if you're interested in seeing more designer profiles, and let me know which designers would you be interested in hearing about. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time.